Good to have you here. Um, many of you from rooted in this community, some of you from uh, further afield. So wonderful to have Dr. Ratan Lowell here today. Um, Alanda has a multi-page uh, <laughs> bio uh, for an introduction. Uh, Dr. Lowell has said, oh, please don't do that. Um, some of you uh, were here when he was with us before. Um, Dr. Lowell knows a lot about soil. Uh, world, uh, world known, of course, you can Google him, so we're not going to take up your time with any more than that. Thank Welcome you. back to MTSO. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's really a great honor and privilege to be here. I have many fond memories when uh, Mr. Gore was, and uh, we were having a debate discussion on soil and climates. So I thank you for the invitation. It's uh, uh, very much a matter of honor and privilege for me to be here. I'm going to talk about climate and um, soil. So to begin with, uh, let's talk about uh, when did agriculture begin. About nine to 14,000 years ago in the Near East, uh, where everybody uh, knows agriculture was the beginning crops like uh, emmer, and corn, barley, pea, vetch, lentil. Northern China, about 9,000 years ago, rice cultivation, Papua New Guinea, sugarcane and root crops, six to 9,000 years ago. Central Mexico, Aztec, Mayan, of course, maize, squash, beans, three sisters, as many of us call them. Indus Valley, that's where I come from originally, 7.5 to 11,000 years ago wheat, barley, and jojoba cultivated there. West Africa, 4.5 thousand years ago, yam and cassava. Horn of Africa, 5 to 7 thousand years ago, teff, coffee, cucumber tree, yaba nut. Eastern North America, Cherokee. There was agriculture here, 4 to 5 thousand years ago. Cranberries, Chenopod, marsh elder, maple sugar, tobacco, squash, sunflower, knotweed, little barley, may grass originated here. And then Western North America, 6,000 years ago, the Pueblo dwellers, amaranthus and pine nuts. I think it's good to know what came from where. It's very important. Uh, Sometimes we think. Uh, forget the history. And of course, South America, Inca, 7,000 years ago, cultivating potato, beans, and coca. Many civilization collapsed. Sumerian, Mesopotamia, collapsed 10,000 BC because of salinization of soil. Hadapan civilization, Indus Valley, they collapsed 2,000 to 2,500 BC because of desiccation. And then Incas collapsed 750 to 900 years. CE is soil erosion. Mayan also soil erosion. Axum, ecological degradation. And Roman, of course, 27 BC to 395 AD because of exhaustion of soil. And the reason I want to mention this great civilization forgot that soil was the basic of their uh, foundation. And for getting that uh, has a very heavy price. At present, uh, year one, population was about 200 million. We had 130 million hectare. By the way, hectare is a two and a half acre. Pasture land, about um, 110. And at present, population is 8 billion, the red line at the bottom. Agricultural land is one and a half billion hectare. Pasture land, 3.7 billion hectare. So total agricultural land is 5.2 billion hectare. That is more than 12 billion acres. That's a lot of land. I honestly think we don't need that much land. Out of which irrigated land area at present is 350 million hectare. And if you understand what a kilometer is, so if you monitor water used in kilometer, one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer, that's a kilometer cube. We use 3,150 kilometer cube of water for irrigation. 
lot of water, lot of land. Do we need all this? I'm one of those who don't think so. Now, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, um, pre-agriculture was 200. You remember agriculture, I said, began about 10,000 years ago in different parts of the world. And then pre-industrial revolution, that was 1750 circa. It had already gone up by 80 parts per million. And the reason it had gone up was because deforestation, biomass burning, draining of wetland, plowing, it emits greenhouse gases. At present, it's 420 parts per million. And this is now both due to fossil fuel and agriculture. So agriculture is a very important part. What I would like to share with you is that uh, since the beginning of the agriculture, we have emitted from land use, cultivated cropland, pasture land, 575 gigaton of carbon into the atmosphere. Not everything stayed in the atmosphere. Some got absorbed by ocean, some got absorbed by vegetation. Compare that with fossil fuel since 1750, 450. Now, fossil fuel is catching up. But what people do not realize is that agriculture has been, until 1930s, about 80 years, 90 years ago, more carbon came from land use and agriculture than from fossil fuel. So total for 10,000 years ago, agriculture has been a major source. And that source is deforestation, degradation of soil. So some of that 575 gigaton, we should, we can put it back. And that is the solution to the problem. I think that's why it's important to know where it came from. Soils of the world, the top plow layer, the plow layer alone, cropland soil, one and a half billion hectare, have lost since about 200 years ago, 135 gigaton. And those soils have lost their quality, health, productivity, and therefore uh, we can do something about that as well. So soil and agriculture, uh, here is a, what we call a global carbon cycle. Atmosphere at the moment has 800 gigaton. Giga, by the way, is a billion, <clears throat> nine zeros. So 800 and nine more zeros. That's a billion ton. Um, and it is gaining every year 5.3 gigaton. Fossil fuel emission is 10 gigaton, out of which five stays in the atmosphere. We do the deforestation. We don't have an estimate of soil here. Deforestation contributes to one, the upper every year, primarily tropical rainforest, Amazon, Sumatra, Congo Basin, elsewhere. And 120 gigaton is absorbed by green plants. And by the way, the green plants contain about 620 gigaton. Atmosphere, 800. Fossil fuel is about 3,500. Soils contain 2,500 gigaton to one meter depth. And every year, soil absorbs 60, that photosynthesis of the plant. 60 is respired back, and then soil respires back that 60. And then erosion contributes some. And ocean is, of course, the biggest reservoir. So from this diagram, we can calculate how long carbon stays in each of these pools. For example, um, plants, vegetation, trees, on average, stay carbon five years. In soil, it stays on average 25 years. And in the ocean, it stays on average 400 years. So ocean is a very big uh, kind of a reservoir. Let's look at what happens. Uh, in the 60s, fossil fuel emission was 3 gigaton. Land use was 1.5 gigaton. Total about 4.5 gigaton emission by human, out of which 1.7 stayed in the atmosphere ocean absorbed one, and land absorbed one. And uh, I have this kind of data for many decades, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and the current decade. And this year, this year, fossil fuel, 10 gigaton, land use, deforestation, one gig. So we emit 11 
out of 11, five is remained in the atmosphere, three is absorbed by ocean, three is absorbed by land. So the question is, what can we do so that land can absorb more? But more importantly, what we can do that this fossil fuel emission, which is 10 gigaton, can be reduced? I think those are the questions which are very important to discuss. Soil erosion, many people do not realize, uh, even the scientific community debates, it has very good taste. When erosion happens on a plowed soil, it takes away the best part of the soil, which is the clay and the organic matter content. For example, the organic matter content in the sediments, that water runoff that's taking it away, could be two to three times more than what's in the soil. It's concentration, and that's called enrichment ratio, because it removes preferentially that light fraction. So erosion is a big thief, both by wind and water, which takes away. Globally, soil degradation is affecting one-third of the Earth's land area, one-third. This is a recent estimate, 33%. And out of that 33%, uh, 1.1 billion hectare is affected by water erosion. I showed the picture. Another half a billion hectare or more by wind erosion. Salinization, that salt accumulating that uh, happened in the Mesopotamia civilization when they vanished, uh, 0.9 billion hectare. So soil degradation is really a major part. One part which we do not appreciate and each one of us, eight billion, is a culprit. And that is per capita food waste which is taken to the landfill amidst gases. I want to let you know what you do, including me. North America, 860 kilograms of carbon dioxide per person per year from food waste. Industrial Asia, 810 kilogram. Europe, 680 kilogram. Latin America, 540. Uh, North Africa, 350. South Asia, 350s. Each country. Food waste, one third to one fourth out of 3.2 billion tons of grains produced, one billion ton reach no stomach, human or animal. They are wasted and they go to landfill, fresh vegetable maybe as much as 40-50% and fruits, especially in developing countries. These estimates are underestimates and many statistics are not known. Each one of us can do something about it. Now that brings me to the soil. Soil is really the essence of all life. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. Charles Kellogg of USDA said that very well. I have added a sentence to that for myself, and that says that rhizosphere, that the root soil here interface at nanoscale is the only place in the universe which has the divine powers to resurrect death into life. That's the only place. And you can understand all that biomass, everything, goes into the soil, it eventually becomes dust, dust to dust, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, plants take it up, new life begins. Now the only place where we know in this universe, other planets we do not know yet, outer solar system, but this one, the only place. So this soil is the largest reservoir of carbon, and soil contains two types of carbon. You can see the dark part, upper part of the soil, the organic carbon, humus, like you buy from potting soil, very dark color, it's a humus compost. The lower part is uh, lighter color, and in a drier climate, that lower, lighter color <coughs> has inorganic carbon, carbonates, bicarbonates, and so forth. So two types of carbon in soil. Total organic and inorganic to one meter depth, three feet depth, about 2,500 gigatons which is three times the amount in the atmosphere, four times the amount in all the vegetation. So it's a very uh, 
So on a different depth basis, if you take the top 30 centimeters, that 12 inch, soils contain total about 940 gigaton. To one meter, they contain about 2200 gigaton. To two meter depth, to 5000 gigaton. And to three meter depth, we everything combined together, 6000 gigaton of carbon to three meter depth. That means if small change happen in soil, atmosphere get overwhelmed. And that's exactly what we are doing. We are mismanaging the soil and atmosphere get overwhelmed. But if you can take carbon from the atmosphere, put in soil, there's a direct relation that soil is really a major, major sink of atmospheric carbon if we can manage it properly. And now this is what happened. Imagine 200 years ago, 250 years ago, settlers just coming in Ohio. And the forest soils in Ohio, which we have forest here, had carbon probably about uh, 100 ton, metric ton per hectare, about 50, 60 ton per acre. And this carbon, as the deforestation happened, and as the plowing was done, and the plowing is a system which mixes oxygen in the soil, and that oxygen decomposes organic matter, and the decomposition releases nutrients. That's why plants grow better when we did not have fertilizers. Plowing releases nutrients from decomposition of organic matter. So within about 50 years after the forest was removed, this carbon stock of the soil here in Ohio and elsewhere in the Midwest decreased about half to what it originally was. By decomposition, by erosion, I showed you what erosion does. So if the erosion continues, the carbon stock continues declining. If somehow we can stop soil erosion by conservation, agriculture, and so, it reaches a steady state, constant level. And this at constant level, if we adopt better agricultural practices, like conservation agriculture, no-till farming, cover cropping, better grazing, carbon stock will go up. It will follow a sigmoid curve. In one generation or so, 25 year, 30 year, it will reach another equilibrium now under the new better agriculture condition. And at that point in time, if you follow better agriculture still, it can take another sigmoid curve, another 25 year, and probably can get back to the same level as we were before. Theoretically, it may never get it. Worcester, Ohio, we have plots which we started doing this kind of practices, and it has reached about 85% of what originally was. So it can, after perhaps another 100 years or so, it might get closer, but agriculture will really keep it uh, lower level than necessary in some soils, such as those which had uh, acidity in them, or those which had uh, dry condition, no irrigation water, or any other limitation, it may be possible to go beyond what the original was. There are some cases, but not the Midwest United States. Our soils are very fertile, very young, only uh, about uh, last ice age, that's uh, old as they are, so uh, 10,000 years ago. So these are the very young soils indeed. So there is no possibility for our soils in the Midwest to go beyond the original level. So from these experiments, we can calculate what we call carbon sink capacity, which means where you are now and where you can be. If you adopt better agriculture, we can calculate the rate of carbon sequestration, which is the slope of this line, delta y over delta x. We can also calculate the mean residence time. I can calculate pool and void by flux and see how long that uh, soil carbon which I put in will stay there. Uh, and I can also find many agricultural practices, such as conservation agriculture, which can do this uh, restoration, uh, recarbonization, if you like to call it, sequestration, biochar, agroforestry, desertification control, um, afforestation, pasture management, water harvesting, cycling, uh, farming system. But each one of those practices has its own carbon and water footprint. Uh, 
uh, we want to minimize the footprint, but it is there, and therefore, from the gross rate of carbon sequestration, we must deduct what the cost of carbon for doing the business, and you calculate the net rate. Healthy soil should look like this. Very dark, fluffy color, lot of roots, lot of earthworm, lot of microorganism. A healthy soil would contain five metric ton of living organism by weight in it to ferocialize that per hectare. And many soils, when we put in agriculture and a lot of plowing, a lot of uh, pesticides and herbicides, of course, those organisms don't survive, all of them. But even if we got half of that, we're in good shape. Unfortunately, many soils I have worked in, Asia and Africa, uh, also Central America and the Caribbean, we are lucky if we have half a ton. These soils are approaching dead soil. They have been killed. The organisms have been killed. The soils have been killed. If there's no organism, the soil is dead. Therefore, there is a need to bring about transformation in agriculture. Why? Because the current agriculture system are characterized by five Ds. Deplete, degrade, destroy, discard, dominate. Take away from nature whatever you can. We need to change these five D through better practices, science-based, and those practices include uh, characteristics which are based on five R, reduce, reuse, recycle, regenerate, restore, and return land back to nature. And I'll show you how and how much. I think there are not many people in the world who I could say would agree with me. <laughs> I hope even one or two if you agree, I, I would be <laughs> great. What happens is in nature, we have a coupled cycling of water with carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. When we deforest, when we plow, when we take away the crop residue, when we do not return to the land anything, <clears throat> land rebels. And that rebellion is that this coupled cycling becomes decouples. And it's the decoupling that causes emission of carbon in the atmosphere, erosion, the algal bloom, all the problems that you know exist. They come because of the decoupling. And that decoupling has one major effect and that is human health. Because health of soil, plants, animal, human, environment, and the planet is one and indivisible. When you drive through a countryside and you see well-to-do people, you can be sure that their soils are very healthy and well-to-do. When you drive anywhere and you see people are miserable, starving, and suffering, you can be sure that they have passed their misery to the soil. And the soil reciprocates. And this vicious cycle is affecting more than 3 billion people around the world. John Muir, he made a statement when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else. I would hope to teach a class one health. I did not succeed yet. <laughs> Two, three years ago, the, uh, the committee, uh, our um, brilliant uh, committee, they are brilliant people, academic affairs committee, they said, gee, it doesn't fit in our curricula. Of course it doesn't. Uh, I'm trying again this year, so it may happen. Uh, I'll let you know if it does happen. But this class, if it does happen, I have contacted uh, veterinarian, uh, pediatrician, cancer specialist, uh, those who deal with the heavy metal, a plant pathologist, uh, agronomist, soil scientist. We are 10 of different disciplines. We teach one class. So that the health of the people doesn't necessarily come from injection and pill, come from a healthy soil. And a healthy diet is grown in a healthy soil. And that, that's the basis behind it. So we also think when we talk about let's fertilize the soil, we talk about NPK. I think if we think about CNPK, carbon humus before, uh, the need for NPK 
over time will go down. And one of the way to do that is create a positive carbon budget in soil. Soil is like a bank account. You can never take out of a bank more than what you put into it. Otherwise, your bank manager will call you, hey, stop. And soil is the same way. Soil speaks in a different language, and sometimes we do not understand that language, unfortunately, but it does speak. And the idea is that what you put into the soil by any of those good practices must be more than what is taken out by many processes. This is the way we want, but unfortunately, what we have is that what we put in, especially in developing countries where the farmers are desperate, they take away everything, uh, that's what happens. So uh, here in Wooster, Ohio, I had a very good student. I, I had many, many very good students. Uh, Josh Benison, about six, seven, six, eight. This plot, we took away the crop residue. We put all the fertilizer, which was recommended, everything. The crop residue from the previous crop was taken away. And in 2012, we had a very dry season. And by that time, we had taken away the residue for eight years continuously. Next door plot, where the residue was left behind. It's a very simple difference. So when you take away things and you do not, you are essentially taking away the food that microorganisms and earthworm and termites, they need, and you can kill a soil when they do not have a food. And that's exactly what happens. And this is what we call climate resilient agriculture, simple. Leave the ground covered. Take the grains away, but leave the residue for the soil. This equity we must maintain. So that brings me to the question of what's a regenerative agriculture that many people talk about. Mr. Gore, who was here, he takes pride in regenerative agriculture. It's an, it's an approach, it's a strategy, it's a concept, it's an idea. It's not a practice. There are many practices which come under it. And this practice, this idea, uh, regenerative, it's inspired by eco-innovation. It's powered by non-carbon energy. It's driven by a circular economy and green infrastructure. It's supported by the recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere. Re Remember that 575 gigaton? We took it away. We want to put it back. That's called recarbonization uh, as the basic uh, premise. Continuous soil cover, uh, no soil disturbance, integrated nutrient management, complex rotation, produce more from less. That's really the idea, more from less. Less land, less water, less fertilizer, pesticide, less energy. That is what we mean producing more from less. And uh, return some land back to nature, and at the same time, seek some soil-less solution. Aquaculture, aeroponics, hydro, urban cities, uh, mega cities, which we have many. Uh, 30 right now, there'll be 85 by the end of the century. Uh, they should be fed through uh, soil-less agriculture. So my timetable, which I said not many people like to agree, is uh, the following. From 2020 to 2100, fertilizer use. We are using 200 million tons now. By 2100, we should have no more than 50, if you need. And the reason is improve efficiency. Right now, fertilizer nitrogen efficiency maybe 30 percent, 40 percent in U.S. In India and China, maybe 20 percent. In Africa, maybe even less. So improve the efficiency, better soil health, cut down on the rates. Land area under irrigation, as I mentioned, 350 million hectare. We could be 500 million hectare. But the water you use for irrigation will decrease, and I'll come to that in a minute. Cropland area right now, 1,500 million hectare, should be no more than half of that, 750. Absolutely no. Then the conservation agriculture right now is only 200 uh, million hectare, even in the U.S., Worcester, where it was developed. We are only one-third in Ohio, uh, total cropland area under that system. All cropland should only be by conservation. Remember Josh Bernstein standing and tall green crop, that's what I'm talking about. Grazing land, yes, we need cattle. Absolutely we need cattle, but we don't need 3.7 billion hectare of land area for that. 1,500 is plenty if you use it properly. 
if we use our diet properly also. But cattle are very important. Nobody should take a message that cattle are not important. Then it's a land area, how much you're devoting. Same thing to crop land. And water use in agriculture, I mentioned kilometer cube, 3,150. If we did drip irrigation, it will come down to 1,000, no more, but your irrigation area would increase. And at the same time, the crop yield will go up especially in Africa and Asia. And this is a timetable I would suggest to United Nations, if somebody is listening, but you cannot have anybody agree. In fact, the slogan is by 2050, we need 500 million hectares more. No. We need to use our brain more and better. And this is the philosophy of producing more from less by using, bringing science and policy together. And if we did have our agriculture better, the rate of carbon sequestration in soils alone is 2.5 gigaton, which is about 25% of the total emission. And between 20 and 2100, 2020, 2100, eight year period, we calculated that 10 or 15 of us uh, authors on this article. Soils can absorb 180 gigaton. Vegetation, which you return back to nature, would absorb another 155. That will create a drawdown of atmospheric CO2, about 150 to 160 parts per million. So if you stop fossil fuel emission, hopefully by 2030 and 2040, soon thereafter, and do land recarbonization, Global warming less than two degrees centigrade is still possible. Farmers uh, and others, uh, for uh, uh, what can we do together? We can think about stewardship of land resources. We can think about economic incentive. We can think about legal parts. And I'm going to discuss briefly, beginning with stewardship. Judaism, the word homo, man, is derived from the Latin word humus, or the decomposed organic matter, which is the essence of all terrestrial life. The Hebrew phrase tikkun olam, restoring land, healing land. Hinduism, kshati, jal, pavak, gagan, samira. Remember I showed you that uh, health of soil, plants, animal, people is one and divisible? This is where it comes from. Kshati is soil, pavak, is energy, jal is water, gagan is space, samira is air, human body is made of these five elements. I translated that uh, Sanskrit in Punjabi, which is my mother tongue, it says beautifully, pawn guru, pani pita, mata, dharta, maha. Paman, wind, is guru. Pani, water, father. Mata, mother, dharta, soil, maha, greatest of them. In one phrase, the very first opening sentence of the Bible of Sikhism linked all three things together and saying, oh human, protect them. Buddhism, one should not break even a branch of a tree. Christianity, the word Adam, I was giving this talk in Chile a month ago and uh, somebody, uh, I was talking about Adam and Dimitri, they are both in the audience, I didn't know. The word Adam derived from the Hebrew word Adma, meaning earth or the soil. Greek, the daughter of earth goddess Gaia, named Themis, goddess of law, and descendant Demetra, or the goddess of agriculture. And, uh, Adam and Demetra were both in the lecture room that day. Uh, Romans, the earth goddess Talus, was related to the goddess of fertility and harvest, Sears, that's where cereal comes from, and named Matre Thera, Mother Earth. Islam, he created the man of clay like the potters. And uh, we made from water every living thing. Do not overuse water even if you live on a running river. Everything, I, I think sometimes we look at the differences, we should be looking at the commonalities, and we find we have everything in common. That would be the way. I want to talk briefly about agroecology is a spiritual connection to the land and to nature. 
doesn't matter what faith you belong to, I just showed you. Agroecology is a dialogue between worldviews that question whether agroecology seeks technological innovation, environmental soundness, economic efficiency or sustainability are all of the above embodied in a supreme code that springs from the cosmovision of the traditional people agroecology engaged. That essentially means harmonious living, don't be aware. Earth as our mother is a living being, Gaia, the Greek word, that understands human being as a part of the natural world and stands on the extreme opposite pole from that which industrial, technocratic, capitalistic, patriarchal modernity preaches and considers. Agriculture is a primarily about caring for the earth. The growing and sharing of food is therefore a spiritual act. And that was Vandana Shiva. I would like to share with you briefly a few more things, what has happened to global hunger lately. 2019, as you know, was the year just before COVID. We had 678 million people who were prone to hunger. And uh, 2020, COVID first year, 782. These are primarily because of disruption by COVID. 2021, 828. And then came the civil war and war and crisis in Eastern Europe, 1.2 billion now. And of this, by the way, 50 million are in the United States. Of the 50 million in the United States, 2 million are in Ohio. Of the 2 million in Ohio, half a million are children. And even one child going to bed hungry is one too many. We have a responsibility. And it is not because we do not produce enough. The food is not accessible. The food is not available. It's a war and poverty and civil strife. These are the human dimension. And uh, malnutrition and starvation, millions of people worldwide suffer from it. I won't uh, read the last sentence, but it's really important. For some, international hunger is a humanitarian crisis. For other, it's a commercial opportunity, and it is. Therefore, famines are human-made tragedies. We must make famine and mass starvation politically intolerable, morally toxic, ethically unthinkable, and humanly unacceptable. It's not a matter of producing more. It's a matter of distribution and making sure that it's accessible to everybody, which is not. Pope Francis said very nicely about land. Uh, by the way, uh, his encyclic is something I, I really uh, have read part of it. It's great. I salute him. When I look at America, also my own homeland, South America, so many forests are cut that have become land that can no longer give life. This is our sin exploiting the earth and not allowing her to give us what she has within her. I think payment to farmer, for, you remember I was talking about stewardship and then commercial, and then uh, education, I had it. So I'm going to the second part, eco, payment farmer for ecosystem services. If you want farmer to do better agriculture, they may sometimes have lower production and therefore we should make sure that they do not suffer. So. Paying them back is important. But here is, um, I was talking about biomass. A part of the biomass produced by soil must be returned to it. Taking away everything, shoot, root, grains, and without returning any bar is a robbery the soil and a banditry. Removing everything is a particularly self-inflicting banditry because it degrades soil's capacity to restore itself and generate ecosystem services. But the poor farmers are desperate and they have to take, that is where payment to them for ecosystem services, to all of them, all farmers should be respected. And the legal part is soil is a living entity. Therefore, like any other living things, just like universal rights of human, rights of animal, there must also be rights of soil and rights of nature. 
being the essence of all life, soil must have rights to be protected, restored, thrived, and managed judiciously. It also implies that soil degradation, pollution, depletion uh, has a moral and ethical wrong that must be stopped. Soil as a living entity sustains life and has a right to thrive and flourish. And the right of soil is not based on economic benefits, but on protecting and restoring the soil for the greater good of the planet rather than just of the humanity. Therefore, communities should be authorized to bring litigation, if necessary, on behalf of the soil against those who deliberately pollute and do something. I think the last part is probably not necessary if we educate people. Uh, I would recommend that uh, if there is a rights of soil bill, uh, it really considers rewarding those who do good rather than harming those who do not. If you really plot uh, security on one axis, uh, human, gender, social, national, international, regional, and environment, uh, other issues, at the center of all of that is soil health, soil quality because on it depends water security, energy security, climate security, food security, health and nutrition security, environment security, political security, and national security. Lastly, war is a terrible thing. It's terrible for people, we know that. But what we do not recognize is what it does to the soil. Destroying a civilization Soil is the easiest way to destroy them. If you want to destroy a nation or a civilization, destroy its soils. And that's what my concern about war is. Just like people, nature, soil, water, air, biodiversity is also victimized and is a neglected casualty of war that nobody ever talks about it. Think about those tanks churning the soil. Think about this, bombs with uh, heavy metals and pollution. You know the Agent Orange, some of those uh, my age group will remember Vietnam, Agent Orange. Or Still we have birth defects in children and animals and there are many articles, a colleague of mine, Ken Olson, still publishing. State Department is doing something about it. It is going to take generations to heal land. And world's best soils are Chernozums. They are in Ukraine. That's where they white wheat and sunflower and everything. So somebody should speak up that war must stop, not only because people are suffering, of course, it should stop, but we are damaging, ruining our planetary future by ruining the best soil of the world. It's both nature and humans are victimized, and we must speak for both nature and human. Unfortunately, nobody speaks for nature. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Lal, uh, that was a wonderful presentation that you just gave for us. And it gave us so much to think about in terms of our relationship to soil and what we're currently doing and how we need to turn around. Um, one of the interesting things that I pulled out of it because I'm kind of uh, interested in the theology is that all of the D's that you mentioned are really related to what we would call the doctrine of dom dominion, man's dominating the earth. And um, 
how we need to move towards doctrines that are more life-giving. I have a question that is more, is actually geared more towards um, smaller farming and the notion of no-till farming. I was wondering if you could uh, talk a bit about that and how it relates to smaller scale farms and, and how it's beneficial, how it's part of that transformation that you were talking about. <clears throat> Thank you, that's a very good question. Uh, remember a short plowed field suffering from uh, erosion and uh, um, so uh, no till recent uh, work started here in Ohio. In 1942, I think, uh, we had an extension agronomist and um, he wrote the book called Plowman's Folly. Uh, uh, you should uh, look it up, that book. It's uh, Google, you could see, li obviously, library has it. And uh, Plowman's Folly, he says on the very first page, uh, he has never understood the reason why we plow the land except the weed control. So many people do realize weed control is... Uh, so when he wrote the book that plowing was uh, not necessary, and this was 1940s, uh, another book came out from Texas, and uh, of course, you are just the opposite. And the title of that book was The Furrow. And um, uh, Time magazine of the 45 issue has a picture of both books on the front page. And Time magazine called it the greatest debate of the century, plow or not to plow. And uh, Time magazine also said the debate was won by plowing. And the reason was this, there were no fertilizers. Uh, weed control was not possible by any other means. Mm -hmm. So when your ground is compacted, you take away the crop residue. Uh, there's nothing to recycle. There are no earthworms, which are nature's plow. Um, then plowing became essential. Mm -hmm. But as the science advanced and we realized that uh, we could do everything without plowing, as long as you can have natural plowing uh, mechanism. And uh, not many people know this. The first book Darwin ever wrote was not Origin of the Species, mm -hmm. but it was a book called uh, uh, Earth's Mounds. And uh, it was about earthworms. And in that earthworm book, uh, he called them intestines of the earth. That uh, they essentially, they are nature's plow. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. So okay. earthworm will survive only if they have food, and their food is crop residue. So if you do not plow and leave the crop residue on the ground and the soil is always protected, covered by a cover crop or crop, weed growth will also be less, and uh, there is no reason to plow. Mm -hmm. So right now we have uh, at Worcester, at, at London, Ohio, and at Hawthorne in the Lake Erie area, and Coshocton, which was discontinued, plants which have not been plowed since 1960. Mm -hmm. wow. That's where I'm saying the soil carbon has come up to almost equal to what is in the forest. Mm -hmm. Small farmer in Africa, and I had really, I should say, honored to work in Nigeria for 20 years, and I worked with many small farmers. Uh, it is absolutely uh, acceptable if uh, they are provided the equipment to plant by no-till system. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, government subsidizes plow rather than uh, no-till system. Uh, I tried many times, but it uh, did not work. So Africa is the least uh, advanced in terms of adopting no-till. US about 30%, Brazil almost 70-80% much more so than the United States. Uh, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, all those countries doing very well. China and India catching up uh, very rapidly. I think it's a future, uh, give another 30, 40 years, this will be the normal way to go. Yes, the yield can be low sometime, 10%. But then the benefit in terms of 
eliminating uh, energy for plowing, uh, causing erosion, algal bloom problem, uh, the benefit to the environment. This is their compensating farmer for adopting better practices so that they do not suffer a loss is a good policy. Thank you. And I'm hoping that our farm bill coming up in yes. 23 or 20 will have that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm Tim Van Meter, I'm on the faculty here mm -hmm. and um, very much an honor to be sitting next to you. I, I yeah. use and sometimes uh, through ignorance misuse your work, but I'm, I'm <laughs> glad to be learning more to be able to be more clearly mm -hmm. in this. And, several follow-up questions, but one is kind of burning right now. I'm not known for my optimism <laughs> <laughs> when That's it comes okay. to climate change. <laughs> How do you remain this kind of ability to foresee a, an optimistic future? Even, I mean, and, and I know that there are even corporate forces working yeah. against your work. How are you yeah. able to maintain this? Well, um, if I were an optimist, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Um, I no, I, I am very optimist. Uh, things are changing. Um, 93, 94, I made a deposit at Fawcett Center for a conference on exactly this topic. And I lost the deposit money because there were not more than five people who want to attend what we want to talk about. <laughs> so now it is a major subject uh, throughout the world. Um, the COP21, which was in Paris, the so-called climate summit of Paris. Um, the Minister of Agriculture, his name was Stefan Lafol, uh, who was in charge of uh, preparing that declaration. I had the honor he came to my office, mm -hmm. along with his staff. Uh, this was in June, about uh, this time of the year, uh, end of May, early June, when he and eight of his staff and we discussed for two days what recommendations should come out from the climate summit. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, I remember uh, showing you a slide, we are getting five gigaton of carbon in the atmosphere. At that time, this was 2015, we are getting 3.6 gigaton for the whole decade. So his question was, how much carbon can I put back in the soil that can completely negate 3.6 gigaton, offset it. So we said, sir, soil to 40 centimeter depth, that's 16 inch, contains about 900 gigaton. So if you were to increase carbon in soil of the world by 0.4%, that would be 3.6 gigaton offset. True to his promise, he went back and that declaration came from Climate Summit in French, quatre per mil, four per thousand, point four percent carbon in all soils of the world. U.S. is signatory, but we did not implement it. Ah. Now, after that, 2016 was a Climate Summit in Morocco, Mar Marrakesh, Morocco, and uh, as Sometimes things happen I cannot explain. I was the keynote speaker <laughs> for the conference. And of course, my lecture was just what you heard. Mr. LaFolle was there. The vice president of World Bank was there. Of course, the minister of agriculture in Morocco was there. We all created a program called AAA, mm -hmm. Adapting African Agriculture. Smallholder farmer that she was talking about. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they designed a program for entire Africa to implement Katha per mill. You understand good relation between France and uh, Morocco. So um, for Africa at least, uh, they have a meeting on um, 3rd of May of all ministers of agriculture of Africa to discuss AAA and Katha per mill. And I am a keynote speaker there. Mm -hmm. I was just sending an email, uh, my ticket, I told them, put it on United. They said, no, we haven't put it on Air France. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable, but it doesn't matter uh, which one. Um, but it's really, that is what make uh, me, uh, Pope Francis, very, very uh, supportive of this concept. Uh, 
president of Iceland. Uh, he um, uh, asked me how many trees can we grow in Iceland. They had 100,000 cars. No population of Iceland, 300,000, like Upper Arlington. So 100,000 cars. <laughs> he, he wanted to know how many million trees I should plant. So we are net zero emission country. Mm. So I think the, these are very, very, um, uh, by the way, there is a uh, Secretary General of the United Nations had a uh, food system summit in 2021 uh, when he was, uh, he announced uh, that we will create a mechanism to manage soil properly and uh, mitigate hunger. Uh, there is a committee called a uh, Food System Coordination Hub. And this hub has, uh, I think, 20 scientists. Three are from the US, I'm one of those three. So this me first meeting is planned in Rome in July. Ah. So we are politically making progress. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not know how far it will go, but Secretary of State of the United States is making a policy instrument soil health. You mm -hmm. must deal with you favorably if you have a soil health um, better management policy. Mm -hmm. He has appointed uh, Terry Fowler, who is a uh, special uh, envoy to him, and their goal is especially improving soil health of Africa. Mm -hmm. So I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm. I think things are really happening. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Um, yes, I want to uh, recognize uh, that we have a question from... <laughs> yes. The question is not from me. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I have two questions from our online uh, observers. Um, both of them are colleagues here. So I'll start with the second question first, and then the, the first question is a personal practice question. Uh, Dr. Numerick, Paul Numerick, uh, says that he has used material from the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology in his class, and he just wants to know if that's a good resource to use and if they're doing good work. That's the first question. I'll let you answer that lately. Throw them under the bus if you need to, or lift them up if you need to. <laughs> The other one is from Dr. Kate Common, whose question is, how should I manage my own soil in my backyard towards a better soil practice? Thank you. I have a garden in the, in the back, and I, I, I could use his advice, maybe. Uh, I grow my own vegetables. Uh, I have been growing nursery. Of, you know, I'm vegetarian, so quite some of the vegetables that I like to eat, uh, I have to grow. Uh, keeping earthworms happy, so that means mulch their food. So anything I can find in the lawn. Sometimes my neighbor are throwing their lawn clippings and other, and I ask their permission to pick it up, put it back on my garden. So um, anything you can put back, uh, it, compost would be very good. Uh, crop residue mulch, keep the soil covered. Um, keeping uh, soil uh, activity of the earthworm is a very good idea. I also grow deep-rooted crops, uh, such as uh, daikon radish. You know, it can be sometimes 6, 12 inches long. Uh, it makes, and I let them grow through the winter. I went to see my garden last uh, weekend. Uh, some of that radish is now flowering, but uh, it has very deep roots, so it uh, digs up. Uh, so. Keeping the soil fertile, uh, keeping the soil organism living. Um, I would have liked to show a slide called Agreement. I don't know, in South America, there's an Agreement cartoon. Uh, they have created a children cartoon book, which uh, alphabets are more nature oriented. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they show they, in that one uh, children and uh, cartoon of children and uh, some earthworm talking to a professor, and that professor happened to be an Ohio State tie, same tie. <laughs> so you'll see my cartoon in that one. I'll send you that by electronic copy of it, and please distribute to everybody. I, I think uh, it communicates uh, the concept, feed the soil animals, 
to make sure Saul is living. And, and the question on Yale, that's uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, and Gus Speth was involved with them for a while, and others, so I, 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 yeah. I experienced with, they're exceptional, <laughs> a very good place to go for your resources, and, uh, and I also think the, the Center for Earth Ethics, is, who has been a partner here in the past, is another place where mm -hmm. doing good work, but I don't, on the religion side, I don't, yeah. I don't know how much, <laughs> yeah. I, I think science and religion um, should mix uh, appropriately. Yeah. Uh, you know, even Einstein promoted that, uh, yes. uh, both working together, and I try to do that. Yeah. I think it's very important. Do you want, I have another one if you should, but I'll wait for you. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, I think that um, the Yale materials are a little short when it comes to addressing environmental racism. Mm. Um, and also when it comes to recognizing the contributions of people of color when it comes to environmental thought. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of put that in there. Um, I, I, I otherwise do say yes, they're, they're great. Um, I think that's right. Here, yeah. Thank you. So my other question, um, has to do with the Save Soil movement. And I really, uh, when, I, when I first uh, saw it, I was like, wow, I wonder if we could have anything like that here. So I, that, is my, that is kind of my question. Because it is such a very different context, and we have so many other things going here in America. Are you talking about Sadhguru Soil movement? Yes, okay. yes. Um, do you think we could have that type of... I did talk to him um, about uh, maybe a year ago or so, and when he took a, a journey from London to Delhi, and he was supposed to reach Delhi on Earth Day, which is uh, coming up, um, his uh, People asked me to meet him there, and I didn't go. Um, I think uh, it's a good idea to involve religious organization. I fully believe in it, that uh, we can, um, like Pope Francis and other. But the, that journey which he took from London to there, with the doctors and everybody else going, uh, quite a lot of uh, expenses involved. Mm. And um, I'm not sure that uh, I would justify millions of dollars on stopping at uh, every major city. And uh, uh, but I think he was very. They claim having reached out two billion people, uh, making message that Saul is a living thing. Uh, I think these days we have an IT system. We have uh, uh, systems where. Uh, for example, during COVID, um, that was the uh, year and I had uh, uh, kind of a lot of requests to give a lecture. And I gave from a desk 130 lectures to 60 countries. Mm -hmm. 60 countries. Mm -hmm. I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> I was at my desk all the time. I could have never done that by flying. Yeah. If I were able to fly, like going to Morocco, to five countries at my age, I better consider myself lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I was able to communicate with uh, people from 60 countries, uh, 150 lectures uh, in a period from March to December when COVID closed, closed down the community. So I think I salute him and his organization what they're doing, but I think we have probably better means which are more cost effective, especially these days. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. uh, also, I think uh, the important part is uh, to keep your ground firmly on the scientific foundation. Mm -hmm. That part is very, very critical. Mm -hmm. If we ignore science, uh, we cannot do what I was suggesting, producing more from less. Mm -hmm. That is translating science into action. Yes, yes. And uh, I'm really, really hoping that our next farm bill uh, will have uh, 
soil health act because we have a clean air act 67 72 we have clean water act i don't think we could have clean air and clean water without healthy soil mm -hmm. so it's about time to have a healthy soil act yeah and yeah. that would make a role model for the world to follow thank you yeah i have a couple questions um you were talking about adding soil or adding carbon into our soils um, but you specifically mentioned that that should be powered by non-carbon energy sources. Um, could you talk more to that? Yeah, I'm essentially saying don't allow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the conservation agriculture has five principles, depending on who you talk, at least I think that five. Do not allow, leave all the energy on the land. Uh, I showed you an example, what happened at Shockton, Ohio. Follow complex rotation, not just corn soybean always, corn soybean pasture, meadow integrate crops with trees and livestock, so mixed farming as we used to have before, and integrated nutrient management. Means the biological nitrogen fixation, mycorrhiza, recycling compost, and whatever you need supplement to get the required yield, uh, add by chemical fertilizer. So chemical fertilizer are supplemental, not the only thing. Mm -hmm. And there my philosophy is, you know I came from 200 million ton, bring down to 50 million ton. And my philosophy mm. is that uh, the difference between poison and medicine is the dose mm -hmm. and the time mm -hmm. and the method. So I'm willing to take that 50 million Africa right now. And I'm going to say that to the ministers when I meet them on 3rd of May, 40 kilogram negative budget of nutrients and PK on a continental scale. That is why we have the food situation very bad. That's why the crop yield in the world is five tons and Africa is 1.5 tons. So I cannot say don't put fertilizer. Put fertilizer as a medicine. Proper dose, proper time, proper rate, proper, and make sure soils are healthy to respond to them. Mm -hmm. If soils are not healthy, they are degraded, polluted, compacted, high temperature, no water, you're broadcasting fertilizer, it's a pollution. Yeah. I want to say Nate's our farmer, yes. our lead farmer on very campus. Good. And so we and are he's, very proud of and he's farming farmer. soil. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. I really appreciated that, just that you were here in uh, the lecture and everything. I have another question. This one's kind of bigger. So trends in agriculture, we see a lot of like investment going into like more indoor, more controlled environment growing. Do you see that as being a part of a potential solution, freeing up degraded lands to be able to like go more into like regenerative, longer term forestry? Or like how do you see those two kind of fitting together? I do not know whether you are referring to the new environment uh, control facility at the Ohio mm -hmm. Waterman yeah. Farm yeah. to go indoor. This is where I come from. Um, we have 28 mega cities now. Mega city, city of 10 million people. Uh, another five, six years, we're going to have 35 mega cities. And by 2100, we're going to have 85 mega city. Largest mega city will be Lagos, Nigeria, 85 million people. A city of 10 million people requires 6,000 tons of food a day. Mm -hmm. So a city of 30 million people requires 20,000 tons of food a day. I think city planners must think producing part of the green grocery. Obviously you can't grow corn and soybean and uh, other things in the uh, greenhouse in city limit by recycling water and nutrient that come mm -hmm. from the city. So tall skyscrapers, control environment facility to grow green vegetables, tomato, cucumber, celery, lettuce, and aquaculture, hydroponics, aeroponics, uh, uh, down in the basement and at the ground floor, the store to sell food, then the children will be right, food is coming from the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So, soil-less <coughs> urban agriculture is going to be a very important component 10, 20, 30 years from now. It's already coming up. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are skyscrapers, one or two in Chicago, uh, Singapore many, you know, Singapore has no land, so they have no choice not to do that. So, I think, with 80% of the people living in urban centers, very soon, right now it's about 60%, 
we have to go the route of soil less food production. Mm -hmm. Besides, soil is so, it's a different kind of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think we have to do the same thing. People are sooner or later going to move, uh, and then eventually, maybe by the end of the century tomorrow, we have to learn how to grow food under no gravity condition. That's also agriculture. But these are the kind of new agriculture we have to begin their science study now. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. You are an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not have ticket to Mario. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I will be um, presenting on regenerative farming and spirituality in Assisi, Italy, this year. And we'll, prior to that, we'll be with some members of the Dietetic Castry with my colleague, Dr. Christopher Carter. And a big part of what I will present on is the possibility of soils as being a healing space for, the, for that. Um, I want you to know because I would love an opportunity to grab coffee with you so I don't sure. misuse your research prior to doing that. But also the um, energy and desire from uh, members of the Spirituality and Sustainability Global Network, which is a small group that they're growing, uh, the Earth Charter people, the folks from the UN that work from the SDGs uh, from a religious side, there's a real strong desire for your work and your research in this area of how do we rethink what it means to be human sure. on this planet uh, from a spiritual basis. Well, congratulations. I'm glad that you're going to speak on that topic. Uh, I really think uh, bringing the people in theology, that's your group here, uh, religious group, uh, is very, very critical. Uh, imagine if uh, I mentioned Islam and Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, if all of them could create uh, an environment where to their congregation they will talk about the need to protect Mother Earth, uh, need to connect people with uh, nature, mm -hmm. with soil. Uh, that would be really a great... Uh, uh, so this is what I'm thinking, where science and religion working together, along with the policy people mm -hmm. and along with the others, uh, medical doctors, where uh, we tell them that uh, good diet, uh, good food is a good medicine. Food is a medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think that co concept, uh, uh, I really am more optimist that you are talking to that group. <laughs> that, that's more optimism. I'll be very glad to visit with you. Have a Zoom or come over sometime. Okay. And, uh, I'd love to go to Columbus for yeah, coffee. There is good coffee down there. <laughs> <laughs> We have a question from one of our audience members. Yes. Hi, thanks. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Lal. Um, I was I was trying to jot down references as your slides were going, and I, I don't know if I missed one, uh, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about this or um, give some suggestions for further reading. So um, your, I think it was the timeline part, the timeline slide about reducing the necessary amount of cropland um, uh, was, was in one part of the, your talk and then, you, but you were also talking about no-till farming and that, that occasionally yields could be lower. Um, I'm assuming that the balance there of being able to reduce land while it, accepting some potential reduction in, in yield from a particular piece of land has something to do with regenerating currently degraded soil. Yeah, yeah. Can you give, um, well, hold on, let me add one thing to that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I often have conversations with people who are saying, um, and, and I never know how to like edge in on this debate because I don't have, you know, being an English teacher, I just don't have <laughs> <laughs> the necessary background. Um, oh, you know, the population is growing. It's a choice between conventional agriculture and like killing human beings. What, like, what sources could you point a, a humble English teacher toward when she's having such a debate about how that, like not just looking at a single piece of land, the yield from a single piece of land, but at a global picture of regeneration and how that might actually provide more than, than people might expect. 
Thank you. No, that's a very good question. Many people are saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. If I'm saying reduce land area, and there's also some lower yield, uh, will we have enough food for everybody? Then that, that's very valid. And that's, uh, I'll answer that uh, first, the food waste. Remember I said, even the U.S. Secretary Wilson uh, of Agriculture mm -hmm. of the U.S. indicated 30% waste. Uh, he was being conservative. Uh, it's at least 40%. Mm -hmm. So food waste is first part. If you can find out <clears throat> one gigaton of grain produced which are wasted, how much land area and water and fertilizer it takes to produce it, uh, not producing it is is a good option actually. <laughs> <laughs> so th that is one part which, the second part when I say reduce yield, I'm not talking about reducing yield in developing country. Uh, their yield right now is one and a half ton, should be four ton per lab. So they will go from one and a half ton to at least four ton. So yes. South Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, their yield is not going to decrease. Now, come back to Ohio, for example, and we had a farmer here a few minutes ago. So if you are getting 10 ton of corn grains and three tons of soybean, and uh, I say, well, adopt conservation agriculture, so rather than 10 ton, you're going to have nine ton of corn and two and a half ton of soybean, and society should compensate you uh, for having lower yield, that's what I'm talking about. So it, it's not the poor farmer that they have to go up. Uh, I think that's a, that's a part which is, uh, which is very, and for them to go up, I don't want to sell them fertilizer right away. I want to sell them a practice which will restore the soil health so that when they apply fertilizer, they are effective and their, their efficiency is, uh, is higher. One other example I wanted to show you was uh, mentioned to you rice production in Asia. You know, uh, Asia, almost uh, four billion people, half of the world population or more, uh, primarily depend on rice. How is rice grown? Rice is grown by puddling. You know, you've seen the traditional buffalo plowing the field in a mud field and then flooding it to six inches our way. Well, that rice will produce probably six tons, seven tons of uh, rice grains. And after that, you have to plant wheat. And because now wheat is being planted in a, a degraded soil, which was deliberately degraded, so production of wheat is lower. But if rice was grown aerobically, like wheat, its production will not be seven ton, but six ton. But imagine the saving of water and energy. And I know one million tons of rice grain in India are harvested, put them in a bag, and they rot there because there is no place to store. Mm. Mm. So what I am saying is decreasing yield is in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. Rather than wasting all that water and all that energy, take lower yield, grow aerobic rice like we grow wheat. That's a science. Is there any particular source, like a book, an article that you could point me towards? For more Cer certainly, we can, and, and uh, I think while we are, for example, Soil Protection Act, do you know each kilometer of new highway, which now they are coming everywhere in the world, <laughs> even in South Asia and Africa and everywhere, leads to deforestation of native land. Mm -hmm. So urbanization, which is happening, uh, is really getting some of the best land ever. I would like to produce a soil map of the world where we demarcate the prime agricultural land and say, thou shall never touch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is the policy I would like to have. Mm -hmm. You drive through China and India and Pakistan and elsewhere, you find brick making kiln everywhere. One meter of topsoil is scalped for making bricks. Why? Cities are growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. And there's no timber, there's no forest, so brick. That one meter of soil took millions of years to make. That is why I want to demarcate the best land, identify an area where 
the entire district or county or whatever can mine the soil for brick making. Mm. Why scalp everywhere? Mm -hmm. This is what Soil Protection Act should be. We do not recognize it takes uh, millions of years to make a foot or two feet of soil. Mm. And we destroy them in one plowing and one stroke of wood. Mm. That is what we need to teach Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. Do not destroy it. Do not, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's a foundational religious it's principle foundation. everywhere. Mm. I think one of the things we can do, um, and I'll work with Alanda, maybe Dr. Carter and Dr. E, is to get resources together that yes. allow these to, through our library and to that to make them more publicly available to where we can continue this conversation in religion, ecology, science, agriculture, and go forward with that. So we'll, we'll do that follow up. I'd be delighted to work with you. And yeah. I'll also yeah. send you some of my own publications. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I hadn't thought of it more in terms of, of pedagogy, you know, just exactly like how, how would we get the word out? How would we make it uh, just more accessible for people in terms of groups and congregations and things like that? And I think that's something we can definitely work on, creating that. So thank you. But I really appreciate your program where you're talking about uh, protection of nature and mm -hmm. how spiritualism could be linked to better agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so since I came to MTSO, I have just learned to grow plants in my office without killing them. <laughs> <laughs> what are, what are, do you have recommendations for those of us who are primarily consumers instead of producers on how we can encourage a better you know, soil yield, soil production, uh, encourage the producers to do things better by our consuming. I think consumers have a very important role to play. <clears throat> our food labeling system should sh show exactly how was food produced, uh, how was corn produced. And uh, <clears throat> some private sector company uh, can do a good job at, for example, uh, I met a company called Gavos. I do not exactly know how to pronounce the name. And the CEO said, we buy corn grain to produce ethanol. They produce ethanol for Air Alaska. Only from those farmers who produce corn with conservation agriculture. So I think consumer can really make a lot of difference. Uh, I, I met somebody this morning from Rwanda. I think she said she was a <laughs> development officer. Uh, she's here. Oh, and I, I want to tell a very good story. Uh, I visited Rwanda many, many years ago, and I saw Rwanda coffee on steep slope was always mulched by uh, banana uh, leaves. And, uh, and, and I said, oh, gee, how, how come the farmers know to keep the ground always covered? And they said, the Belgian government, which is buying coffee from us, they'll buy only if it's grown like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way. So consumer can really decide. So look at the, um, I also a little concerned about, you know, the question about yield. When we say that we want to pay farmers uh, price per bushel of grains, should we be paying what is in the grains rather than the weight of the grain? Like the quality of the grains, protein content, micronutrients, 17 micronutrients. They are needed for human health. They must be in the grains. So I like to see what is in the grain mm -hmm. and pay farmer according to the quality of the food. Mm -hmm. And healthy food obviously comes from a healthy soil. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that link. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I may, I also, every dollar you spend matters. So if you buy your vegetarian diet from Cargill and Tyson Foods, you are not helping the planet. <laughs> But if you buy it from your local farmer and buy it as closely yeah. as you can, yeah. who use the right practices. But I do want to say that I respect the right to have animal-based diet, uh, as long as it's in moderation. And you know, for example, white meat, uh, chicken, fish, pot turkey, others, uh, their carbon footprint is not as much as the 
red meat. Once in a while, red meat is okay too, but I don't think we want to have three times a day. <laughs> I think moderation and balancing. It. So I'm not, although I have never tasted meat myself, I, I realize that's why I will never take off the animal part from my timetable. They are very important part of, and we need to respect people's uh, right to have whatever they want. The question is of moderation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and balancing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, our, our time is coming short for this conversation. Um, I was wondering if you had another question. We had one person. Or just... We have one more question. Okay. Would you please? Yeah. Uh, my name is, uh, my name is Ari. Um, I am one of the interns here studying um, farm science and agroecology and stuff like that. What can people in my generation do to continue to improve soil health and especially if what can I do if I want to go into a career similar to yours or something like that? Uh, <clears throat> our <clears throat> planet's future lies in the hand of your generation. So I think if we could have a <clears throat> younger generation uh, aware of what nature uh, is and how to protect uh, soil, water, air, biodiversity, and make sure that its quality and its health is maintained. Uh, you remember there was a teenager from um, Denmark uh, who said, how dare you, I forgot mm -hmm. what her name was. Uh, Greta uh, Van Greta, 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 yes. Yeah. <clears throat> how dare you, uh, I still remember that speech. Uh, I think, he, I don't want you to ever become violent, no, but I, th <laughs> I think uh, uh, creating awareness that yes, we are uh, looking to our future and uh, we need uh, soil, water, air, biodiversity, everything transferred to us, next generation, better than the previous generation had received uh, from their forefather. But then you also show uh, that you are willing to sacrifice. I, I want to mention that sacrifice. Right now, the global average carbon footprint of the world is about four ton of CO2. Global average of US is 20 ton. Global average of Africa is one ton. Mm. Global average of some rich country, Arabs, is uh, probably uh, 50, 60 ton. Mm. So our generation, in the US, let's say 350 or so million people getting there. Uh, let's say even if half of that 150 is younger generation. If you decide that you want to reduce your carbon footprint by judicious management, not necessarily sacrificing the standard of life, improving the choice of doing better things, um, the world will be better. And oh. you can certainly, and the reason for that is each one of us is a culprit and a victim. Mm -hmm. And as a culprit, we have a responsibility yeah. to sacrifice mm -hmm. something. Oh, uh, also you mentioned a book that was a uh, no plow soil book from like 1942. Is, what is the title? Plowman's Folly. Plow, Plowman's Folly? Yeah, Folly, folly. 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 foolishness. Uh, it was by Edward Faulkner. Thank I can you. send the uh, cover page and reference to Yolanda. Yes, I'll I'll send it out and I'll send it out in an email or if you give me your email, I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah, I think they were saying something about having more getting like resources to um, or the. That's what I do. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think I have an. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about this. Later. This is it's, not the it's time. It's my one superpower as a librarian. <laughs> I I can do it. Uh, I want to thank everyone who made this happen. There were so many people involved, and I also want to thank world-renowned scientist Dr. Ratan Law for agreeing to come and speak with us. Thank you.